Okay, uh, now we are on the Italian influence in the poetry of Chaucer. The Italian period, as I told you earlier, was one of the most productive periods and, uh, in the poetry of Chaucer. And uh, <clears throat> during this time, he wrote the famous work, Trillius and Cressida. Trillius and Cressida. Uh, these are the old spelling. William Shakespeare also based his drama Trillis and Cressida on this one. And uh, this is a very important drama uh, as uh, it was in, in, uh, during that time, there was not a tradition of writing the dramas in this way. Uh, the dramas were produced in the uh, theaters, the, like I said, the miracle plays and the morality plays. But it was not uh, in this way that uh, they were writing the tragedies, and uh, it was based on the Italian, uh, the Italian model, and uh, also the Aristotelian model of tragedy. And uh, this work is also discussed by Sir Philip Sidney in his Apology for Poetry. And uh, Philip Sidney marks it as one of the most important dramas in English literature because at that time uh, Shakespeare was not there and uh, Shakespeare was uh, not even born at that time uh, when Philip Sidney was writing and uh, that's why he considered it one of the, uh, the greatest drama in English literature. Uh, but after that when Shakespeare came every great thing was below Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe and later on many more drama days. <clears throat> so uh, Trillis and Cressida the story is uh, the story of Troy uh, the story of Troy, uh, rather, it was the Italian model of the story of Troy. Of the story of Troy. Uh, Troy was a Greek city, as you all know, and. Uh, the whole Europe had their own versions of the story because it was uh, in the old times, the stories uh, were not written. They used to uh, reach other people through uh, or oral speech and uh, through oral communication. And there was not much focus uh, given to the writing of dramas or writing stories. So there are a few versions of the story. Uh, one version is the Greek version of the story one version is the French version of the story, and one version is the Italian version of the story. And this story is about Trillis, and uh, Trillis is the son of Priam. And uh, he, uh, he was killed by Achilles, and uh, he was in love and, and all that. So the, the story is not important, but uh, the drama is uh, very much important, and it was written on the Italian model, and uh, it was regarded as the first uh, drama and uh, first drama was, uh, that was written and uh, in the narrative form or uh, you can say it, uh, it was written like uh, in prose and uh, uh, prose and uh, it, it was a mixture of uh, uh, prose and poetry and uh, like uh, if you uh, know the opera singing do you know the opera or opera opera is the Pakistani pronunciation and uh, Opera is the real pronunciation. So, uh, if you know opera, it was the yes, it is a music form, and uh, it was it, it was in earliest time it was a literary form. It was uh, uh, like uh, a poem was sung by the singers by a single singer and uh, in the company of orchestra. So, the, uh, and uh, if you look at the Italian model of uh, drama you will see that the dramas are more lyrical rather than uh, in the prose form. So Chaucer followed the Italian model in this uh, drama and uh, they can ask you what drama was written by Chaucer and they can ask you what drama or what most important work was written in his Italian uh, time period or under the Italian influence. And uh, by the way, what was Italian influence? Uh, Chaucer, he was... Uh, uh, an important member of the parliament 
and he used to visit France, uh, France and Italy. And when he visited Italy in 1372 or 1373, the, the years are not very, uh, are not accurate because at that time there was no written form of uh, history. And uh, these are uh, just, there is a difference of opinion among the scholars of history about his visits and about his days uh, altogether. So uh, during his visit to Italy, he met the great poets of Italian language, Petrarch and Boccaccio, and they are most important writers at that time in Italy. Petrarch and Boccaccio, and also at that time, the influence on literature, on Italian literature was Dante. And Dante is very important when we talk about European literature, and we will talk about European literature after that. Uh, after the whole, uh, after going through the English literature, we will go back to uh, American literature and also to the European literature, the European writers uh, of the era. And Dante is very important because he was a Christian writer, and uh, although he wrote in Italian, but uh, he was a Christian writer, and uh, his work is very important the, uh, in which he, the Paradisio, Paradisio is Paradisio. It was uh, the work of Dante, and uh, Chaucer was impressed or inspired by uh, these writers very much. Another important work of this era is the House of Fame. The House of Fame. House of Fame or the House of Fame. And uh, it was a dream poem and it was taken upon the model of Dante. That's why I mentioned Dante earlier. And uh, Dante's Paradisio is actually uh, a person, uh, is an epic. The Paradisio is an epic and, uh, by Dante, and it is actually a journey of a soul from different eras, from different uh, time periods, and journey to paradise from hell. Uh, first of all, the soul enters the hell, and uh, there is a lot of detail and, uh, involved in there uh, by Dante, and then later on, enters, the soul enters the purgatorio or the purgatory or the cleansing area where it, it got cleansed off all the sins and then later on it was admitted to paradise and this was an epic written by Dante and it is very much celebrated uh, epic and it is uh, known as uh, the name with, uh, with which it is known as the Divine Comedy and uh, the Divine Comedy. Actually, Paradisio is one of the portions of this, the Divine Comedy. And sometimes they do ask you of Dante and they ask you about the works of Dante and which is the most famous work of Dante, the Divine Comedy. Okay, and the Divine Comedy has three portions. The first portion is uh, uh, the Hell, uh, sorry, Inferno, Inferno. The second portion is Purgatorio. Torio. And the third person, uh, portion is Paradisio. I don't know Italian, but uh, these uh, I know the title. And uh, these this is how the, these words are written in Italian, or you can simply say them. The hell, the purgatory and the paradise. So uh, the House of Fame was based on, was a poem, it was based on uh, this work of Dante and it was during, it was written during the uh, time period of Italy, uh, Italian influence. So uh, <clears throat> in the third period, the English period, it covers the last 15 years of his life the last 15 years of his life. I'm writing all, the, all these things because these are very important. The last 15 years of his life. And uh, the English period is the period in which we see the Chaucer as he was, the Chaucer, the poet, 
the English poet as he was. The first work which he wrote in this uh, during this time was uh, the Legend of Good Woman, and uh, the Legend of Good Woman was a story, the Legend of Good Woman, and uh, these are uh, a group of our series of stories. And uh, these series of stories were uh, the stories of good ladies or the famous ladies that uh, were classical legends in the history. Uh, when I say legends, the classical legends, I mean the classical stories. Legend is a story for that. And uh, the story which is uh, very much common and the traditional story, or you can say the classical stories. And uh, uh, Chaucer uh, worked on this in. Uh, in English, and uh, it was not influenced by any work of, uh, uh, you can say, uh, any work of, of, of uh, Italian poet or a French poet. It was purely his own genius. And then the greatest work of Joss's life or that era is the Canterbury Tales. The Canterbury Tales, as you know, are very important. They are very important for a few reasons. The first being that at that time there were no models of in English literature to be followed. The, when I say no models, I mean no models in on the literary scene which you can follow. And uh, he was the first one to innovate something. Then an important uh, uh, element in these tales is his use of satire. It was not, a, it, satire was used, but it was not in this way like Chaucer did. And uh, how he was able to do all these things, because he was a man, he was a traveler, he was a very wide traveler, and uh, he remained sometime in France, sometime in Italy, and uh, there he was in the court, and that's why he was very observant. And uh, when a person is, uh, his ob power of observation can be seen in the uh, prologue to Canterbury Tales. And uh, the, prologue, the prologue, in fact, is more widely read than the Canterbury Tales, the actual tales. And uh, it was not a complete story. It was, it was not a complete work. It was just uh, 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 in the midway when Chaucer died. It was not a complete work. And uh, that, uh, that was one of the reasons that uh, people only read the prologue and another reason is that uh, uh, only the prologue is in the university courses. And uh, that's why people don't focus too much on doing something extra uh, than the syllabus. So uh, the uh, Canterbury Tales, as we all, all know, is a story of uh, a visit or a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Beckett. Saint Beckett in Southwark. Southwark. Okay, so uh, Chaucer, who was living in London at that time, and uh, if you are going towards south, then you have to cross the London Bridge, and uh, you go to the South London, and then you go to the Southwark. And uh, on the way to uh, when you one crosses the bridge in the olden times, when uh, one crosses the bridge of London, or the London Bridge, as you know it, uh, then uh, the first end which one comes across was uh, the, the end in the, the Tabard's end. The Tabard's end. It is not there now, but it was very much important as uh, it is mentioned in many other works of literature as well, or uh, not in uh, works of literature, but uh, in the historical uh, works or uh, in the chronicles of the time or in the newspapers of the time. So, <clears throat> uh, a group of travelers, and uh, the travelers in all are 29, and if you include the poet himself, then they become 30. And uh, all of these were required to tell Two, day, two tales on going uh, going towards the Saint, uh, towards the shrine of Saint Becket at Canterbury, and all of these were required to tell two stories on the return, and it was done in order to cover up the uh, the time, uh, the time of travel, 
and uh, the total stories which were planned were 120, but Dosser did not live on to write all the 120 tales or all the tales by all the uh, writers. And this work was influenced by Boccaccio's work, Boccaccio's work. And uh, what is 120? 120 are the tales, are the number of tales which he uh, originally planned. Uh, if 30 people tell two tales, uh, if, uh, if you divide, uh, multiply 30 with four, then it becomes 120. So <clears throat> uh, Boccaccio's work was the Cameron. The Cameron. The Cameron means the 10 days of storytelling. The 10 days of storytelling. This is an Italian work. And uh, uh, sorry, it was written in uh, Italian, uh, not an Italian work. It was a, uh, you can say it is an Italian work, but it's a wrong expression. Uh, this work is in Italian language and uh, written by Boccaccio, who was the famous poet of that time. And uh, it means in English, it means the 10 days of storytelling. And uh, Chaucer followed his model very closely and he wrote the stories and the major, uh, major characters of these tales are the ecclesiastical characters, the wife of Bath, and uh, also uh, the people who belong to uh, the fighting flower, sorry, the uh, army, the knights, the squire, the yeoman, these three are very important and uh, I am writing the names of uh, the characters which you are supposed to do as your homework. Where, because uh, we don't have uh, so much time right now to focus on these uh, works, uh, but uh, I have a plan that after going through the uh, whole history, we will do uh, a bit uh, detailed work on uh, the courses, on the courses of universities, uh, Sarboda University and Punjab University and also other private institutes. So uh, at that time we will see it, but now uh, for the moment you have to study these characters and uh, the ecclesiastical characters, which is also the religious characters and uh, Characters. Uh, which are priors, monk, the seminar, the prior, and all that. And uh, the Oxford cleric, these are the ecclesiastical characters. And then we have the, the knight, the yeoman, the squire, the wife of Bath, very important character. You will have questions on uh, all these characters. For example, they can ask you how many uh, husbands did uh, wife of Bath had, or uh, who, uh, what was written on the locket of uh, uh, yes, wife, and uh, what was written on the locket of uh, the prioress. M or Vincent Omnia, Love Bonkers All, it was written on. Uh, and uh, who was the person uh, who was very good from among the clergy, and uh, it is the Oxford cleric and uh, the summoners and, and all that. So they, they can ask the questions about that. So this is the homework that you have to uh, focus on the Canterbury Tales, and you are supposed to do it uh, fully. Uh, I mean the prologue. And Another important writer of that time is William Langland. William Langland. And uh, his work, which is very important, and you must, uh, under, uh, you must remember this one, Fires the Plowman. Fires the Plowman, or it can also be called Fires Plowman, uh, without the article the. Fires Plowman. Fires the Plowman or Fires Plowman. And uh, this is an alliterative poem. Alliteration is the literary term, which I forgot to uh, mention in the last lecture because someone asked me a question about alliteration. What is alliteration? Alliteration 
uh, is the repetition of the, uh, of words with the same which are beginning with the same letter. For example, uh, the married mother. morning if you see the married mother of the morning tribe uh, this is not a uh, line from literature i have just uh, in, improvised it uh, if you see the married the mother and the morning these three words uh, start from the letter m and uh, if a poem is alliterative then all the word uh, all the lines have this this form of alliteration uh, in it, and uh, this is very difficult to maintain because one has to have uh, one ha uh, has to have a lot of vocabulary in order to find the proper words, and uh, also one has to follow the meter. So this is very difficult. It is not very easy, but it was uh, uh, the famous literary technique at that time, and uh, it is. <clears throat> Uh, alliterative poem, which is like in a, in a series of dreams in which a person uh, fires the plowman, uh, which is the name of the protagonist, and uh, he tries to find something ideal in the world, and uh, he travels from place to place in, uh, in order to find uh, this ideal world or the ideal thing, which he, uh, he was, uh, this was a Christian work. With, when I say Christian work, it means it was religious work. And uh, this person, the pirate, the plowman, he uh, goes on from place to place in search of an ideal life or a place where he can, uh, religious idealism uh, was involved in there. And uh, this is the problem which was concerned to, uh, which was well, very much a matter of concern for many writers. And also today, we also, uh, we, the people of Pakistan, or the Muslim people, uh, we also are in search of religious ideals, or idealism, religious idealism. We want to see a person who is perfect, who is perfect religiously, and then we require him to speak about religion. But this is a wrong approach, because idealism does not exist in this world. Uh, but uh, the poets, they are after idealism, as you all know, and uh, they are finally, uh, they are always finding the shortcomings of the society, they are highlighting the moral ills of the society, and they are trying to find a solution which, is, which cannot be found, because there is no solution to this imperfect life. So, uh, Pires, the plowman, his journey ends up, but uh, he does not find uh, religious idealism anywhere, an ideal solution or uh, any uh, moral yeah, you can say any moral ending of the uh, of his journey, and uh, he finds out that uh, individuals are imperfect, and the society is always lacking. It always lacks something. And then an important uh, writer. Uh, sorry, uh, for, I don't think I should uh, mention Wycliffe. Uh, I should first mention John Gower, who was literary person. Uh, uh, in this age, there are a few persons who are uh, not literary. They are religious but they are very important uh, for us to understand because they are connected to the generation which is coming up, uh, the Renaissance or the Elizabethan age. Uh, so I'm not mentioning John uh, Wycliffe first, I rather I would like to mention John Gower. And John Gower, he is not very much uh, famous and uh, he was a landlord and uh, he wanted to write and that's why he uh, wrote and uh, there are three major works of literature uh, by him and I am just writing the names. Okay, these are the major works and uh, the first one was a Latin work. Oh, sorry, it was, uh, it has a Latin title, Mirror de Omni. It is a Latin title but the work is itself is Anglo-Saxon work. The second one, Vox Clementis, is the Latin work, and the last one, it is the English work, and we are concerned about this point. 
confessio amanti. This is the title is Latin, but the work itself is English. And if someone asks, if a question is asked of you, that uh, which English work of John Cover do you remember? So you have to answer confessio amantis. Confessio amantis means the confessions of a lover. And uh, in this poem, uh, John Goyd, this is a very moralistic poem, the didactic poem. And in this poem, he uh, mentions uh, the sins he committed in his uh, in search of his love. And uh, he also mentions seven deadly sins of love, which is very important. And uh, which is very, uh, not very important, but it is very interesting. And uh, the deadly sins are, uh, the deadly sins in Christianity are uh, very important. And uh, these are uh, the gluttony, uh, like uh, if you have uh, studied, uh, what was the name of the work in which uh, uh, Dr. Faustus, in, uh, in Dr. Faustus, we see uh, the seven deadly sins coming on stage and uh, doing their act. And uh, John Gower, he improvises seven deadly sins of love. And uh, uh, you can say uh, it, is, uh, it follows the model of uh, Latin poetry. Ovid, Latin poetry, Ovid. And uh, in, this, uh, in the whole poem, he just confesses the sins which he has come, uh, as he called them sins. And uh, they are not uh, really sins, but uh, he calls them sins. And uh, because he did not find his love in the end, and uh, that's why he, uh, he says farewell to love, but he does not uh, vow chastity. He, he bids farewell that uh, he did not find love. But he does, does not say in the whole poem, he does not say that uh, he will not do or he will not commit these crimes again or these sins again if he is in love again. So this is uh, just a confession. This is not uh, like you can say uh, a form of uh, retribution or something like this. And then we have John Lidgate. And uh, he is known as one of the pre-Renaissance writers. The reason being that he was born after Chaucer uh, died. Chaucer died in 1400 and Lydgate uh, worked around 1431, 1440s, uh, and uh, this was his time period. And uh, <clears throat> this makes him a pre-Renaissance poet rather than a Chaucerian poet is a pre-Renaissance poet. And uh, his works are, the best known work is The Fall of Princes. Princes. And uh, <clears throat> he also uh, enjoyed a lot of popularity due to his work the Troy book, the Troy book. And as you know now, the Trillis and Cressida by Chaucer was a story of the Troy, and this too was influenced by Chaucer. And uh, <clears throat> in this book, we see uh, the story is about the, uh, the Troy, uh, the city of Greece, which was uh, fallen uh, in, in the uh, previous centuries and uh, it was, uh, Troy was in fight with, uh, I don't remember the uh, name of the other fighting tribe, uh, <clears throat> but it is not from English literature, it is from Greek literature. Uh, does anyone remember which city was Troy fighting against? The city of uh, Agamemnon, or Helen, <clears throat> no, okay, no problem. So, uh, uh, John Lidgate is one of the pre-Renaissance writers and uh, he had two major works to his name and uh, one uh, poem in which he praised Chaucer is known as the Regiment of the 
regiment of princes. And in this poem, he praises Chaucer, but this is not very much important work. His most important work being the other two. So <clears throat> after these writers, I am going to move towards John Byplay. Just a minute, please. Okay, John Wycliffe, uh, I, I will just finish with John Wycliffe because the Azan has been called. Uh, John Wycliffe is a very important person. <clears throat> and you must remember him not as a literary person, but as a person who laid foundations of Renaissance in English. And uh, why I'm saying this, that he he got uh, he laid foundations of Renaissance because he was the first person to translate Bible in English. Bible at that time was written in Latin, and uh, Wycliffe, being a very much reformist type of person, and uh, he wanted to reform uh, the church, and he was well aware that the church was. Uh, not doing very well on moral grounds, as we see in Chaucer, Chaucer's prologue, that uh, the religious class is not doing very good. They are uh, just uh, asking people for arms, and they are immoral, and uh, they are not doing the work which they are uh, charged with, or which they are responsible for. And uh, John Wycliffe was the person, he felt that the power of church is gaining more ground than the power of the government of England. And at that time, the church had so many resources, so many lands and resources, that it even overpowered the government. The resources of the church were more than the resources of the government. And they were very rich, the church was very rich. And that is why church uh, established its influence and no one would, would ever dare to speak against the church. But John Wycliffe, he was the person who was educated at Oxford. And uh, Oxford at that time was not a very secular institute. It was a religious institute at that time. And uh, he was a religious person. He was a religious scholar. And uh, he was, but he also studied uh, the secular thing. And he was a real scholar. And uh, he translated Bible for a number of reasons. And the first reason which he gave was that the people should not follow the church, they should follow the Bible. The Bible was the primary text and not the church. And this is very important because church at that time was an institution which did not follow the Bible as we see uh, in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. We see the, the character of monks, the summoner, the priors and, and all that, the prioress. Uh, they are not concerned with religion. And the church at that time was not concerned with religion. It, it was concerned with power politics. And John Wycliffe was the person who said that uh, if you uh, want to remain Christian, then you must revert to Bible. And he's also called the father of English prose. John Wycliffe is called the father of English prose because of his translation of Bible. And uh, you know the father of English poetry is Chaucer, but the father of English prose is John Wycliffe because he translated the uh, religious text into English. And uh, why he did so? Because he wanted to uh, wanted Bible to be uh, prosperated, to be read by the common people, and they should understand what the church is, uh, what the church stands for. And by the way, uh, as a matter of general knowledge, who was the first person to translate the Holy Quran? And what language was the Quran translated in the first place? So, you know the name, but you don't, uh, you might not know that, the, oh, no, 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 Latin. <clears throat> the Quran was first translated into Persian language by Yes, by, I'm writing my answer. Yes, Shavalila. 
and uh, Shavariullah faced uh, was a reformer as well. But uh, we must not compare him with John Wycliffe because John, John Wycliffe is not a Muslim, and uh, Shavariullah was a really great scholar. Uh, he was from the ulama, the real ulama, and uh, he was the one who uh, actually uh, fought against everyone uh, in translating the Holy Quran because people believed uh, the ulama of that time believed that Holy Quran should not be translated, and they were right. Uh, it cannot be translated as uh, the, uh, the Arabic text is. Uh, but Shavalullah wanted people to connect more to Quran, and that's why he translated it. But uh, uh, the Quran cannot be translated because all of you know that uh, there are a lot of words in Arabic which have no equivalent in another language or in uh, Persian or in English and all that. And uh, if you have to understand or enjoy the Quran, the, the real the gist of the religion, then you have to uh, understand Arabic and then uh, go with it. So, <clears throat> and John Wycliffe uh, started, uh, John Wycliffe was. Uh, in fact, wiped out by the church. By I say wiped out, he was fired from Oxford because he was teaching there, but he was fired from Oxford under the pressure of the church. And uh, everything, this, this thing is happening from long ago. Anyone who uh, tries to speak against the uh, established authorities, they throw you off. And uh, John Wycliffe was thrown out and uh, he died uh, in peace. Uh, he was not uh, very much... Uh, uh, troubling sort of person, but he initiated a sect, and this sect is known as the Lollards. The Lollards were uh, later on, they worked a lot and uh, they laid foundation to many things. And uh, now uh, Azan is going, uh, is over, and I'm just turning the class off. And uh, Allah Hafiz. And uh, one more thing. Uh, about timing of the class or